Mystic a mystic is someone who theorizes, someone who immerses themselves deep into the mysteries of the universe, studying all theoretical bases, although not yet knowing how to apply them in practice. Mysticism is a state of consciousness. It is the first step made by a person on the path of magic. Meaning that you can't come to magic using pragmatic reasoning. You just won't understand it. You won't be able to feel it, to recognize it. It won't come to you. First, you should change your consciousness from pragmatic to mystical. The worldview changes. And the worldview, I'll remind you, is the mental realm. The mental realm undergoes a reconstruction and this new structure starts to collect new information which intermingles slightly differently and a person starts seeing what they haven't noticed before. They link the relationships of cause and effect a bit differently and a mystical worldview emerges. Then, of course, they begin to practice, one way or another. By the way, esotericism is very closely related to mysticism. It just has a slightly different formulation. Esotericism is an exchange of verbal knowledge, while mysticism comes in other forms, not just the verbal. Then the witchcraft starts. A warlock, a witch, is someone who has contact with one particular force. And as a rule, a warlock rarely knows what kind of force that is. Meaning, he could mistakenly think that he is working with light forces, meaning with angels, but in actuality it could be completely incorrect. Another thing is that he is never being informed in advance, because he is an instrument of certain forces who are interested in doing something here. They are leading certain processes. Forces in general rarely view a person as a singular unit, same as we don't view ants as individuals. Same with them, they view humanity as a mass. It's just that out of all humanity they pick consciousnesses that are more or less open, able to channel these forces. Therefore, a warlock or a witch is a conduit, a conduit of a certain force, but only in a one-way fashion. The force goes in, the force comes out. He himself doesn't give anything in return. In this way, a warlock or a witch are heralds of certain forces. They get financially rewarded for their work. Usually warlocks and witches work for money and don't rise higher in that regard. And since they're bond, with a force is one-sided, to say the least, they don't always understand how, what for, and how much they should take. And so they often make mistakes that we have just mentioned. They set an incorrect price and find themselves settling the bill, or it can also happen that by overpricing their services they actually put themselves in debt, owed to another person. The rules are quite strict here. And a debt owed to another person is a societal debt, which marks the warlock places a certain seal on him, a debtor. Accordingly, the world, the egregorial system, will not view this person as a potential mage. And what that is, I will tell you a bit later. It will view him as an ordinary person who creates debts with those around him. And so this warlock gains a vulnerability depending on the circumstances that he happens to find himself in. What do we mean by a certain seal? It is a hole in one's consciousness. If the warlock does something that carries a societal consequence, to say it mildly, then society has a right to hold him accountable to it on the general grounds. Meaning that it will not look whether there is a force behind him or not. He bears the seal of a debtor. He owes people money. Which means that he is not exactly a good associate to humanity. And since he is not a very good associate, then he is my client, says the egregor, which means that I can use him as well as his force for my own benefit. This is how, unfortunately, many warlocks and witches, by falling into the debt trap, met very, very bad ends. A great example of it is the famous white magus Yuri Longo.
and Grabovoi, because they started taking money for wrong things. And more than their services were actually worth. Accordingly, the first time it happened, forces looked at them. The second time it happened, forces gave them a hint. Third time, they reprimanded. And fourth time, they said to the egregors, it is your client. I don't need him. I have no use for him. He's not under my protection. Why didn't they advise him? Because he's a warlock. Warlock don't hear the voice of the force that they work with. You could spend a long time trying to tell the ant, don't go there, there is a spider. But you could only truly make the ant avoid that direction by dropping sugar along an alternate route. And sugar is a metaphor for energy. Who would waste it on you if you don't hear? On the contrary to warlocks and witches, mages are people who have a two-way relationship with the force. They know perfectly well what force they're working with and how much this force's services cost because every force has its own value depending on its hierarchical rank and level. A mage always knows what kind of force he's working with, he doesn't make a mistake in identifying it, and as a consequence he never makes a mistake in estimating the cost or the work. I would also like to add that in our world, here, where we live, there are no mages who are fulfilling commercial tasks. Mages don't work commercially, they don't work for people. Working for people, usually warlocks do that, who make money that way, just trying to survive. Mages always have a different source of income, and as a rule, they are not dependent on people, and try to make their life independent from people or people's money. Not spending their time on people, if, of course, they don't have a certain contract with forces that specifies them to do so. Mages usually remove themselves from the social plane and have contact with people only when it is needed by the task at hand. Because they are in service. They serve another force. They never serve people. And in order not to serve people, one must be independent from them in all possible ways. It is always the mages who make revolutions, social experiments, and wars happen. But mages are not the instigators of these processes. They are always the conduits of the will of the gods. Gods are leading the processes here, and people are merely their instrument. It's just that gods view mages as minds that you can communicate with, and you can hear their feedback, meaning that they can take their point of view into their consideration. Mages and gods, they always work with populations, masses. There are mages of different sources. Sometimes they are called progressors. And there are certain categories of mages who work on specific social planes. Some work directly with people, helping them to find their self, to awaken. Some work with rulers, exclusively only with the ruling realm, not getting distracted by those who happen to be below that level. Some work with specific castes, specific structural entities, that develop certain movements and currents. So again, everyone has their own job to do, everyone has their own assignment. But no mage out there would practice witchcraft, casting spells and sending curses. Investing their force into one person, one individual, is of no interest to them. Mages always work with larger volumes. So mages would come at a different price, people don't settle with them, forces do. Forces who hire them to fulfill certain services. Mages are never dependent on people. They try building their lives not to depend on people's money.